So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jan Magielski. I am the external events VP of the PNS Society. Uh, and today it's my pleasure to open our series of uh, physician shadowing events uh, that will be held virtually. And today uh, we are honored to guess uh, to have Dr. Omar Chowdhury as our guest. Um, he is the assistant professor of neurosurgery and radiology, as well as the director of Penn Center for Cere Cerebral Revascularization, as well as a co-director for Cerebral Vascular and Endovascular Neurosurgery. We are very happy to have you, Dr. Chowdhury, and now uh, I will uh, give you the floor for your presentation. Great, uh, thanks, Jan. Can you guys uh, hear me okay? Also, I will just quickly add that it would be appreciated if you can open, uh, 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 if you can turn on your videos, your cameras. And uh, I don't know, Dr. Charlie, what's your preference, but usually we do the Q&A session at the very end of the presentation, but it's up to you. Uh, yeah, that should be fine. I think, okay. um, um, again, the, I think the beauty of this uh, format is that, uh, you know, it's a small enough group that if there's any questions, I want this to be more interactive and everything. But yeah, I think saving the questions till the end is a good idea. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Omar Chowdhury. I'm um, uh, one of the neurosurgeons at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, um, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to all of you. And um, I was just saying during COVID times, it's hard to uh, meet a lot of college students. And um, I just uh, feel like this talk is special uh, on those fronts because uh, it allows me to interact with uh, a lot of you who are passionate about neurosciences and to share some of the things um, that are a part of my clinical practice and my research and uh, and how uh, it could kind of fit in with some of the goals and aspirations for many of you in the group. So um, I've kind of constructed my talk to share a little bit about my journey uh, towards getting into um, a field uh, which is closely connected with neurosciences, which is neurosurgery and what specifically is the, um, is the clinical practice or the kind of uh, diseases or patients that I take care of, um, the research that I focus on, and um, how exactly uh, it, what, what my practice in my day looks like. So I'm gonna start by sharing a little bit of my story um, as in, uh, in terms of how I got into neurosurgery and what was the whole journey like. Um, um, and uh, I'm gonna start advancing my slides here. So. Um, I was essentially uh, born in Ireland. Um, uh, I come from a family of physicians. My dad was a surgeon and uh, he was uh, um, doing his specialty training uh, in Dublin and uh, working at Cork and that's where I was born. So just by default, not having any ties to Ireland, I was born there. And then my family is originally from Pakistan. So after spending a couple of years in Ireland after my dad was practicing there, we went back to Pakistan. and. Uh, I uh, spent most of my early years in Pakistan in the city called Lahore, and that's where I ended up doing my uh, high school. And I also did my medical school in uh, one of the coastal cities called Karachi, uh, where uh, one of the universities, um, uh, which is a well-known medical school there, called Aga Khan Universities, uh, where I did my medical school. Now, the, the, the fun fact is that they don't really have college uh, back in Pakistan. So you essentially transition from high school to medical school, so if you know that you want to be a doctor, uh, things will work out pretty well because you save some years. Um, but uh, but I, I think, so that's kind of the pathway I followed. So then um, I knew pretty early that I was interested in neurosciences or neurosurgery. Um, so during my medical school, I used to come during the summers and work in a number of different labs doing research. Um, and. Uh, you could look at it as kind of being similar to the stage you guys are at right now in terms of being in that early phase of really being interested in neurosciences and exploring the specialty more. Um, so um, in my the first year of medical school, which would be right around where you guys are, you know, equivalent level for college, um, I, I spent a whole summer um, at Mass General Hospital at Harvard uh, working in a lab which studied um, using oncolytic vir viruses for treating brain tumors. And this was kind of my first experience of working in an animal lab or an animal model uh, for treating brain tumors. And they had genetically modified viruses that were injected into these mice. And uh, they were, it was a pure virology lab that looked at 
how it, they could be modified for treating uh, uh, brain tumors in mice. And um, that was kind of my early work. And uh, I worked with the neurosurgeons, uh, Will Curry and Bob Martuzzo, who was the chair of neurosurgery at Harvard at that time. Um, and then as I progressed in my years of medical school, it kind of solidified my interest that I really wanted to do something in neurosciences and neurosurgery. And um, for people who are interested in neurosciences and once you get into medical school and you wanna have a clinical career, uh, the bifurcation points usually comes in whether you wanna do neurology or neurosurgery. And uh, because my dad is a surgeon, I was always fascinated by the surgical aspects. A sur surgery was certainly one of those things that um, I, I tried to pursue early on. Um, so I did a neurosurgery rotation in, in, in the fourth year of med school, um, which was at one of the hospitals in Detroit at the Henry Ford Hospital. And then uh, because I was still exploring surgery as a field, um, I spent um, a month and a half uh, at Sloan Kettering in New York, uh, working as part of the hepatobiliary surgery department. And um, I worked with uh, Ron DiMatteo, who was uh, one of the surgeons there and uh, it's a small world that he's now the chair of surgery at Penn here so he was my mentor when I was um, um, a medical student there and um, it was interesting that because I had already done my neurosurgery rotation after I did general surgery I really knew that neurosurgery is what I wanted so it kind of solidified um, kind of my interest in the field um, so um, really the road to neurosurgery was defined by my sub-internship experience where I really knew that these were the kind of patients I want to take care of. And I was always fascinated by the research as, as well as the, uh, the neuroanatomical courses early on in medical school. Um, and then, so the inspiration for neurosurgery for me came from neuroscience courses, from really learning about neuroanatomy, uh, taking care of these patients that are acute. It's a challenging and rewarding field. And I do think that mentorship early on uh, from the mentors that I mentioned really helped me shape uh, my interest in that area. And again, I, I found the research in neurosurgery as being really a game changer and really translational because a lot of those things really don't have cures or solutions. So you're really going into uncharted territory in a lot of the areas as I'll share uh, as we move along the talk. Um, so the, the beauty about neurosurgery is, and I'm sure that you'll have other neurosurgeons um, on your panel uh, as well in the future, is the fact that neurosurgery is one of those fields that no matter what you're interested in neurosciences, you can always find your niche. You can uh, focus on pediatric neurosurgery, which is taking care of uh, children with neurosurgical problems. There's trauma neurosurgery. There's tumor neurosurgery, which is focused purely on brain tumors. There's functional neurosurgery that really goes into the science um, of uh, conditions such as Parkinson's disease and tremor and people with uh, uh, pain issues um, and uh, with obsessive compulsive disorder, whatever are the diseases that have a scientific correlate, um, uh, functional neurosurgery is what targets that. There's spinal neurosurgery, there's peripheral nerve, there's cerebrovascular and endovascular, what I focus on and I'll share with you what that looks like, and skull-based neurosurgery, which is also part of my practice. Um, and the bottom line is that the, that the road to getting into neurosurgery is this long, winding, arduous process that probably starts very early on for a lot of people, but uh, it's a culmination of having research in the area, of having mentors who are neurosurgeons, having a competitive uh, step one score, having recommendations, and really starting early. And it, it fascinates me that uh, these days a lot of people who are in college, they already know that they wanna go into neurosurgery or some neuroscience associated um, clinical specialty, uh, which is wonderful because it puts you a step ahead of the game and really writing your story early on, uh, which, you, which puts you ahead of the game and in getting into the specialty. Um, so after I finished my medical training uh, in Pakistan at Al Khan University, um, I um, um, ended up uh, getting into residency at Stanford University in 2008. And um, it's a seven year program and um, um, seven years sounds like a lot, but if it's something that you enjoy and if it's something that you've worked for all those years, it, it's just the seven years really fly by. And uh, during those uh, seven years, you get two years for really defining uh, your niche within neurosurgery. And there are people who do uh, different kinds of fellowships. Some people do lab-based research, some people go on for medical missions outside the country. That's kind of how 
the residency at Stanford was constructed. And um, I used those two years to get additional training in endovascular neurosurgery, which is more catheter-based work for treating blood vessel problems in the brain and spine, which I'll share with. And, and mentorship, again, takes a very important role. And uh, Gary Steinberg was the um, chair of neurosurgery at Stanford when I was training. Uh, um, and he really was the predominant influence. And, and I felt as a junior resident, seeing patients with cerebrovascular conditions and blood vessel problems was very inspiring. And it has one of the most challenging surgeries and patients who are the sickest and really taking care of them early on in residency and working with a very inspiring mentor is what uh, got me into the field. Um, after I finished at Stanford, I um, uh, did further subspecialty training at UCSF and UT Houston. And these are the two mentors who really shaped me um, into the surgeon that I am today and, and really understanding the field and having a surgeon scientist career that I have here at Penn. Um, so I did my research fellowship at uh, UCSF uh, with Mike Lawton and uh, my skull base fellowship uh, was at UT Houston with uh, our day. Um, and um, uh, these are really the, the key figures in the field that have really defined the field um, in the past 20 years or so. So it was an honor for me to kind of go through that pathway. Um, so uh, the next section that I'm going to share is kind of talking about uh, what the specialty looks like. And when I say cerebrovascular and endovascular, what it basically means and what my day looks like um, and what kind of diseases I treat. So uh, the key is that my practice entirely focuses on taking pay care of patients with blood vessel problems of the brain and the spine. And these are diseases that are focused on blood vessel rupture, blockage, blockage of uh, important blood vessels in the brain, and also different kinds of congenital conditions that people are born with that can create uh, trouble during their lifetime. And it sp uh, spans open brain surgery or uh, open spine surgery and also endovascular approaches where a lot of the work is done through the catheters. Um, and that's why I have a joint appointment in radiology because that's a lot of that work had traditionally been done by radiologists. And now uh, it's really uh, an open field which can be done by a lot of different specialists, specialists. So I do open surgery and endovascular approaches primarily for treating uh, blood vessel problems of the brain and the spine. Um, and the conditions treated are things like a stroke, uh, which is because of a, a blockade of a brain blood vessel. I take care of patients with blockage in their carotid arteries in their neck. I take care of patients with brain aneurysms. I take care of patients with brain AVMs or arteriovenous malformations. Um, I take care of uh, patients with this condition called cavernomas, uh, venous disorders, problems of the veins inside the brain. Um, uh, spinal vascular disorders and the condition called moya moya disease, uh, which we'll talk more about. Um, and things have really uh, evolved very quickly in this field. When I started training in 2008, the conditions that we were treating and the tools that we had were very limited. And now, um, you know, 12, 14 years later, uh, there's a lot more diseases that we treat and the technology and the innovation and uh, uh, you know, research in neurosciences has really uh, created a, a major change in the way we practice things and the options we have for patients, which is very exciting. Um, so initially we used to have tools such as uh, treatment of brain aneurysms with clips and coils. And we had surgery we used to do called endarterectomy to clean up the blood vessels in the neck. And um, uh, now in the next generation, we have a lot more newer devices we have a lot more newer tools, better imaging modalities, fluorescence, um, gene therapy tools, brain stimulation tools that we have for treating a lot of different conditions, which is what makes a neurosurgery so exciting, uh, particularly for cerebrovascular, which is my area of specialty. Um, I think the other key thing is that uh, in neurosurgery uh, is really a fusion uh, when you talk about cerebrovascular as a fusion of different specialties. You have people from radiology. This is Pierre Lasjunius, who's a French radiologist who did a lot of work understanding blood vessels, the brain and the spine by looking at radiology images, by looking at angiographic images. And this is Yashir Gil, who's a Turkish neurosurgeon 
who did a lot of the founding work with microsurgery or doing surgery on the brain under the microscope. And um, similarly, this is Al Roten, who is uh, one of the pioneers um, in neurosurgery who did the initial work and a lot of get into my room. in understanding the the sections of the brain, blood vessels, and cadaveric specimens. So, um, so the, all these people kind of contributed towards making the the specialty what it is today. And this is kind of the workspace where we work these days. We have tools that are based on radiology, which allow angiography. We have an operating room environment, which allows us to do open brain surgery. So it gives us all these tools to use technology. Um, and gives you an idea in terms of how far the field has come. Uh, so we are able to imagine or treating brain blood vessel problems from an imaging perspective. This is an angiogram or a picture of the blood vessel of the brain. And this is the same picture of the blood vessel kind of looking at a, a dissected specimen. This is one of my areas of interest where we study a lot of the correlative brain neurovascular anatomy, where we look at brain blood vessel, how they look like, on angiography, uh, which is the black and white picture that you see over here, versus studying brain blood vessels in cadaveric specimen or anatomical specimens, and looking at uh, various surgical approaches and endovascular approaches for treating uh, these conditions. Um, and the, the bottom line is that at the heart of neurosurgery, our goal is to make surgery more accurate, gentle, and safe um, by understanding the anatomy better uh, by learning technical mastery and by really studying uh, and learning the tools and technology through research. Um, and um, I'm going to go, go through each of these conditions to kind of show, show you how some of these surgeries are done and what uh, the management of some of these conditions looks like and how far we have come in terms of the way these conditions are treated. So brain aneurysms are essentially balloons or blisters and blood vessels of the brain, and they can burst in patients uh, uh, don't do well. 70% of the people, they don't survive a brain aneurysm rupture. So um, when patients are found to have brain aneurysm, treating them becomes very important. Um, and this is kind of how a brain aneurysm forms, where you have a normal brain blood vessel that bifurcates into two branches. And then you have the uh, creation or genesis of a brain aneurysm that looks just like that. It's a balloon or a berry uh, that can burst. And uh, the options that we have traditionally was only open brain surgery where we had to um, uh, remove the part of the skull, uh, use a microscope to magnify the blood vessels 50 times and to use a clip, which is made up of titanium to go and strangulate the neck of the aneurysm and to puncture the aneurysm or to remove the aneurysm to treat it. And uh, with newer technology, we have tools such as coils and stents that we can use from inside the blood vessel for treating these conditions. Um, and I'll give you a flavor of what that looks like by sharing uh, what uh, uh, an aneurysm treatment with clipping looks like. And I have a, a quick video that kind of shows you um, what uh, that is about. So you can see in this video that this is a patient uh, uh, in the 60s uh, who came in with uh, a bleeding of the brain and um, essentially had uh, these, uh, this aneurysm in the brain. And um, let me see if this video is actually playing. Can you guys see this at all? It's just the first, uh, like it says patient history and what you said about uh, 68 or, I think it's now it's another patient history, 75 year old female. Okay, um, let me do this. Let me stop sharing and try again, okay? Let me try okay, sure. Can you see my slides now? 
Yep. Okay, so I'm gonna just play it from the slide. That's probably a better way to do it. Um, so this is a, a case of a, a 68 year old patient who um, uh, came in uh, with a brain aneurysm. Um, and uh, this is kind of what the scans look like. And if you look, this patient had been treated and you can see this whole sac, which is full of blood uh, that was causing this patient headaches and having um, uh, uh, seizures and multiple issues. And uh, this aneurysm has already been treating with something called coils. So you can see there's something at the dome of the aneurysm, which was initially used to pack the aneurysm from the inside, but now the aneurysm has come back, has recurred. And this giant aneurysm, which is a, a balloon full of blood in the brain, um, is causing this, this patient headache. So this is a patient that we took care of and we uh, did all these pictures. This is called the cerebral angiogram where we went in and uh, uh, did this advanced imaging uh, and injected contrast into the carotid artery to look at this aneurysm where you can see an orange, which is full of blood and the, the silver or the gray one are the coils in the middle. Um, so we thought of a number of options for treating it, but this was one of those very complex aneurysms where we really didn't have a very good option for treating the aneurysm. Um, so we ended up uh, doing open brain surgery for treating this aneurysm. And uh, the surgery was essentially uh, done uh, in the operating room that allows us to do an angiogram and also allows us to um, uh, do open surgery at the same time. So uh, this kind of gives you a flavor of what uh, aneurysm clipping looks like. This is the membrane around the brain, which is called the arachnoid. And uh, here with microscope magnification, we're essentially opening up the membranes around the brain. This is called uh, the sylvian fissure split, which is essentially the junction between the frontal and the temporal lobes on the left side. And all the surgery is essentially done under the microscope uh, this is the optic nerve here that you see on the left side. And uh, we're taking down the arachnoid membranes around the optic nerve so that we can find the aneurysm. And the structure that you see on the side is the carotid artery. These are the middle cerebral arteries where the aneurysm is present. And we're carefully dissecting and finding until we get to the ball or the sac where the aneurysm is located. So this is the aneurysm that you can appreciate right here. This whole dome is the, the sac full of blood, and these are the normal blood vessels that are inserting into it. Um, and this is the fluorescent dye that we use uh, that helps us see these blood vessels in surgery. So this kind of reminds you how technology is really the part and parcel of neurosurgery. Like there's no neurosurgical procedure we do that does not employ some sort of advanced imaging, some sort of fluorescence in helping us understand things and see things. And here you can see the normal blood vessels and the ball uh, that's full of clot and full of blood. And here you can see we tried to clip the aneurysm and put a clip on it, but it is so much clot and blood in it that we cannot clip it primarily. So we had to do something called a trapping procedure. And here we're opening the aneurysm, which we don't see so often. And this is the aneurysm being opened where you can see that it's full of clot and it's full of those coils that were used to treat the aneurysm initially. And after debulking the aneurysm and sucking out the clot, we tried to put a clip on it again, but we could not. So now we're thinking of other strategies and you must be wondering why is it not bleeding while we're cutting it? Well, the answer is that we have put clips on the inflow and outflow to the aneurysm so there's no blood coming out. Now during this time, the brain is not getting any blood and you can see we've cut uh, out the brain aneurysm over here. Now we're cleaning the aneurysm from the inside and the brain is currently in birth suppression. So we're giving medications to slow down the metabolic rate of the brain and to make sure that no stroke happens. And uh, we're putting these multiple clips to reconstruct the aneurysm. So the aneurysm has been removed and we're putting these clips to treat the aneurysm um, in a very innovative fashion. So you can see that you have to sometimes think of out-of-the-box solutions for taking care of very sick patients with very complex conditions in neurosurgery, uh, particularly in cerebrovascular. So we've put a total of 13 clips on this aneurysm to really reconstruct the neck of the aneurysm. And this has resulted in the patient having a completely normal or new blood vessel. 
and uh, you will see that uh, as we put the final clip on, uh, that'll stop the bleeding. And um, as we take pictures afterwards, you will see that you have a normal construct uh, um, of the blood vessel. And you can see this is what the brain looks like. And this is another fluorescent dye called endocyanin green that we use that shows us that all the blood vessels are wide open and the brain is well perfused. And um, they also do an angiogram in surgery. This is another fluorescent technique that looks at the flow rate of the blood. And this is an angiogram we do in surgery in the room that confirms that the aneurysm is gone. So treatments like this kind of constitute of what a cerebrovascular neurosurgeon does. It's essentially taking care of blood vessel problems of the brain. A very similar case is this one, the patient with a tiny aneurysm from the carotid artery, which is called the anterior carotid artery aneurysm, um, which was treated in this uh, older lady. You can see that how the small aneurysm in the brain is what caused the bleeding in her brain. And uh, this was again treated with open surgery. And uh, this will gonna give you a taste of uh, what that looks like. And here you can see that aneurysm has been found, this very thin walled, tiny aneurysm. And uh, you will, at the end of the talk, get used to these pictures from the microscope that gives you an idea in terms of uh, how beautiful the neurosurgical procedures are, where you can really uh, feel the anatomy, you can see the things very clearly under high magnification, and you have all the nerves, oculomotor nerve that goes to the eye responsible for the eye movements. Um, and you have the carotid artery and you have this tiny aneurysm that is being separated and identified. And you will see that we will use a tiny clip right there uh, to strangulate the dome of the aneurysm at the thin or weak point so that it doesn't bleed anymore. Um, so this is the clip on uh, the aneurysm right there. And you will see that uh, we will again take pictures that shows that the aneurysm has gone in the very tiny blood vessel that's important uh, for flow in the region um, is uh, present and it's open. So uh, that's kind of what uh, open surgery or clipping of an aneurysm looks like. Um, I'm gonna go into presentation mode again and that'll kind of give you an idea uh, until we get to the next video. Uh, now, what's happened is that since 1998 to 2000, there have been newer and newer solutions coming out for aneurysms where now we can treat a lot of the brain aneurysms from inside the blood vessel. And this basically involves going in from the wrist or going in from the femoral artery in the groin and threading a small catheter that goes all the way up from the arm or the groin all the way up to the brain. And we can treat these aneurysms from the inside. So this is an example of a patient that has this really large aneurysm behind the eye. It's called a large carotid artery aneurysm on the right side. And uh, you can see a 3D picture of what this brain aneurysm looks like. You can see this aneurysm is huge. Now, um, before uh, the 2011, before we had these special devices and tools come out, this is something that would have required open brain surgery. But now we can treat this aneurysm with a special kind of stent that is placed inside the aneurysm and it's called a pipeline flow diversion device. So flow diversion is a concept uh, that was studied and it showed that if you put a special kind of a very thin mesh stent into the uh, blood vessel across the aneurysm, it'll slowly uh, obliterate the aneurysm over the period of months. So you can see this is what the patient's aneurysm looks like before treatment, and this is what it looks like after treatment, where you have a normal blood vessel and the aneurysm has gone away. So that's an answer that shows you how technology has such a major role to play and this is all device development. This device called the pipeline device was developed by a small startup company um, in um, the Bay Area in Palo Alto. And this was then um, bought by Medtronic. Um, and now this device has been used to treat millions of patients with brain aneurysms. And it has really been a game changer. So it gives you an idea on how um, uh, bench research um, uh, in terms of flow diversion uh, can be so translational and game-changing um, in cerebrovascular neurosurgery. Um, and this gives you an idea in terms of what before and after treatment looks like. Similarly, there's another device that we use for treating aneurysms. It's called a web device, which is a, a mesh ball, which is placed inside the aneurysm. So you saw the clipping where we put a clip on the outside. This treatment involves putting 
something from the inside, which you can go all the way up from the wrist or the groin to put this device inside the aneurysm. And this can be used for aneurysms which are very tough to treat with surgery. This is an aneurysm called the basilar aneurysm, uh, which is located right in front of the brain stem at the back of the head. And you can see how the device has completely taken care of the aneurysm. So again, the role of technology, role of research and translation um, can give rise to solutions that are very novel um, in cerebrovascular neurosurgery. Another condition that I take care of is something called brain AVNs or arteriovenous malformations, which are a clump of abnormal blood vessels that people are born with. In fact, it's one of the most common causes of bleeding and seizures in children that haven't had any trauma. It's seen in children and seen in adults, and you can see what it looks like. It's essentially um, abnormal connections between the arteries and the veins, and these blood vessels are weak and they can break and bleed. Um, this is another uh, video that I wanted to share of a patient that has a, a, a ruptured AVM uh, that was uh, treated with uh, surgery that uh, involved uh, blocking the blood vessels from the inside and then removing the AVM. So this patient uh, came up with bleeding at the back of the brain. Um, and you can see on the scan what that area of bleeding in the cerebellum looks like. And this is the angiogram that shows a clump of abnormal blood vessels. It's called the AVM nidus. And these are the blood vessels draining it. These are some 3D color flow pictures that show you how the AVM can be characterized by studying the rate of flow in the AVM. Um, and uh, these can be a problem because these AVMs, if they bleed once, they can bleed again. And the second time, the patients may not survive. So if you have patients who come to us with a ruptured brain AVM, then we have to treat these. And as you will see that this AVM is located all the way at the back of the head in this part of the brain called the cerebellum and right underneath the membrane um, of the brain called the tentorium. Um, and this is where the AVM is located. You can see all these imaging reconstructions allow us to um, find the AVM and treat it safely. Now this is called embolization where we're going in from the wrist all the way with a very tiny wire and catheter all the way into this clump of abnormal blood vessels called the AVM. And once our tiny catheter is inside the AVM, you can see we inject a special kind of material called onyx, which is like super glue that blocks the AVM from the inside. And after doing that, you can see that the AVM is a lot smaller and that makes the surgery which is completed afterwards a lot safer. So this is something that's another part of my clinical practice. And you will see how these surgeries can be done very safely in people and employs a lot of different tools, a lot of different technologies for treating this blood vessel problem in the brain. So this is a lot of stuff. These are videos that are used for resident training and teaching and education, but this will give you an idea in terms of how these surgeries are completed. Um, in a second, as you can see, this is the patient that had the surgery. Um, and whenever we do these surgeries, we place patients in something called Mayfield pins. Uh, and uh, we essentially make a window in the skull um, until we get to the brain and we open the membrane. And this is working underneath the membrane of the brain called the tentorium. And we're again using a microscope view uh, with the images magnified to slowly take down the membranes around uh, the brain tissue where the AVM is. And this is uh, the cranial nerve uh, four, which is, allows you to move your eyes going around the brainstem here. And you can see these small blood vessels called the posterior cerebral artery right here and superior cerebellar artery right here that is going in in the region of the AVM uh, right here. So we're slowly taking down the arachnoid membranes until we get down to the region of the AVM, and we'll do the same thing. We'll use all these fluorescent dyes to find the AVM, define it, and to remove it safely. And all these small blood vessels are the perforators that go to the brainstem. And perforators are very tiny blood vessels that enter important brain substance, and uh, it, uh, it has very important functions. And now we found the brain AVM, and uh, you will see that that clump of abnormal blood vessels is what the AVM is. And uh, we will go in and now carefully start removing uh, the AVM um, in a stepwise fashion. So that's the clump of abnormal blood vessels. 
Now we're further separating it from the undersurface of the brain and taking down all these adhesions until we um, uh, carefully remove it. So um, you'll see as the video progresses that this is the fluorescent dye that kind of shows that this is the clump of AVM right here on the surface of the cerebellum. And this is the vein that drains the AVM. And uh, we're gonna go right ahead and use something called bipolar electrocautery for carefully taking down the AVM and employing all these tools uh, to carefully go in and remove this clump of blood vessels that has caused uh, uh, bleeding in this patient. And you can see this is the temporal lobe of the brain. This is the AVM and uh, this is how uh, the surgery is completed. And I just want to give you guys a taste of what this looks like. Uh, we're using cauterization and slowly using our tools and micro scissors to go into the substance of the cerebellum where this AVM is located um, and disconnecting. It's almost like dismantling um, a bomb where you have to understand the anatomy, take down all these small feeders that are feeding this clump of abnormal blood vessels and ultimately detach it and remove it from the brain. Um, so we're gonna move uh, right ahead um, um, into uh, the rest of the talk here. Um, let me see. Um, this is another example of an AVM treatment where, um, you know, um, is this an AVM at the back of the head that was removed in a very similar fashion and um, uh, employed all these tools that we talked about. So a very similar video that I can uh, skip. Uh, the next part of my practice and the kind of patients that I treat are the patients who have strokes because of a blood vessel in their brain, like the carotid arteries becoming very narrow. This is a con one of the conditions is called Moya Moya disease. Um, it's more often seen in Japanese populations, but it's seen in younger people and also in middle-aged people uh, where the carotid arteries slowly and slowly get narrowed and get blocked. And these people can suffer from strokes during their lifetime. They may be completely healthy otherwise, but they get strokes. And these people, the solution is that we do a surgery called bypass surgery, where we take the blood vessel from the scalp called the superficial temporal artery, and we sew it to a blood vessel of the brain, uh, which is called the middle cerebral artery. And you can see what this is, what that looks like. So this is a blood vessel from the scalp right here that's been dissected out. This is a blood vessel on the brain. And we sew the blood vessels together and do this brain bypass that allows them to get the blood flow in a bypassed fashion because their own carotid arteries are blocked. So this works very well and has dramatically improved outcomes for people who have Moya Moya disease. And you can see um, there's a patient who has this bypass completed, there's a blood vessel going up and supplying a very large region of the brain on these angiogram images. Um, this is again a picture of fluorescence completed. It's called endocyanine green that fills in the area uh, which is uh, being filled in by the scalp blood vessel as a result of the bypass. And this is an example of a bypass completed from two blood vessels onto the brain surface and really making up for the blood flow which is deficient in this patient's brain. This is a patient who has a bypass and this is fluorescence completed. And once we inject fluorescein, you can see all the part of the brain that's now getting blood from this blood vessel from the scalp. So that's the beauty of the bypass. And this shows that blood vessel that's coming in and inserting into a normal brain blood vessel. This is uh, a part of what um, the bypass surgery looks like. And you can see all the blood vessels in red are the blood vessels that are filling as a result of the bypass and the blood vessels in white are the what are filling from the no, from the patient's carotid artery which is blocked right over here similarly stroke care i take care of a lot of patients who come up with acute stroke you may have heard of people who may have a condition where suddenly they stop talking have speech difficulty have facial weakness or arm or leg weakness so i take care of a lot of these patients uh, that come in as an emergency fashion so the lifestyle of a cerebrovascular neurosurgeon is not very good because you could be called in at one in the morning if you have uh, someone who has suffered a stroke and we need to go in and open their blood vessel. Um, and uh, this basically involves the blockade of the blood vessel in the brain um, and can come up with facial weakness um, and numbness, paralysis as a result of that. And it's mainly because of a blood clot that flies in either from the heart 
or from the carotid arteries and goes and blocks these patients' blood vessels. And that part of the brain that gets blood from these blood vessels stops working. Um, so what we can do is that we can, in an emergency fashion, go in from their femoral artery in the groin or from the wrist and go in and remove the blood clot. Now, this is the blood vessel, the left carotid artery in this patient that's going up. And you can see there's no blood going into the brain because there's a large blood clot that's blocking this blood vessel right here. So what I do as part of my job is that I go in and use tools such as suction and such as using special kind of stent reavers, uh, which are devices that go in, engage the clot, and you can remove it from those blood vessels. And it results in the blood vessel being wide open. So this is before and after picture that shows you in someone who has a devastating situation where a blood vessel has blocked their brain blood vessel, um, a clot has blocked their brain blood vessel. And if this is not treated, they would be permanently paralyzed. And by going in and removing this blood clot, you can see how these blood vessels are wide open now. And um, a thing, uh, blood is going into the brain and their stroke is prevented. Um, so that kind of scrapes the surface of what uh, my clinical practice looks like, but you can see that everything that I do kind of focuses around blood vessel problems. You saw brain aneurysms being treated. You saw brain AVMs. You saw stroke. You saw brain bypasses. Everything is focused around blood vessel problems. Uh, there's a lot more in that area, but that kind of skims the surface in terms of what that means. So similarly, my research is also focused in a similar region, and I wanted to share some slides kind of talking about that. Uh, my research essentially focuses on radiogenomics of brain vascular disorders. So what it does is that um, I look at different imaging patterns of blood vessel conditions in the brain. So um, uh, if a patient has a brain aneurysm, I study the patterns or imaging features of that aneurysm and how that ties in with what that aneurysm is going to do in the future. And often studying the genomics of those patients and seeing whether one imaging pattern correlates with one patient having a better versus a worse outcome from a certain condition. This includes aneurysms, strokes, AVMs, all the things we talked about. So what we do is that we take images of patients with these conditions, such as AVMs or aneurysms, and we use those images and uh, draw a region of interest around the pathology. And uh, we are able to derive computational features from those images and tie that in with the patient presentation and develop a data bank of patients with all these conditions. And by using um, algorithmic tools and by computational tools, we can look at what features in imaging are considered to be high risk. So this is really uh, taking the imaging interpretation to another level and using the big data approach and computational features to predict how certain vascular conditions can be more dangerous than the others. Um, and this is kind of what that looks like. We really are able to use some of these features in making up these radiogenomics maps for identifying subsets, identifying high-risk versus low-risk features, uh, and really learning more about these diseases. Um, and similarly, this is uh, looking at the flow patterns inside the aneurysms and really using those flow patterns as computational features for using a prediction. And this, this is really where the precision medicine for cerebrovascular care comes, where you're able to tell a patient with a certain cerebrovascular condition as in how exactly uh, is their risk uh, compared to the population and whether or not it qualifies them to undergo treatment or not. So we're becoming a lot more granular. We're becoming a lot more detailed in terms of how we study these conditions and that kind of what spans my research. Um, so this is kind of another example of some of the advanced imaging work we do uh, for studying these brain aneurysms. Um, so I talked about what my clinical practice looks like. I talked about what my research spans. And finally, the, the most important part of my job, and kind of one of the big reasons why I'm here this evening is to talk to you is teaching and mentoring. And I think that's kind of what makes it all a whole. And and it's about giving back and kind of sharing how my journey to getting into neurosurgery was really hallmarked and defined uh, by having mentors who cared about me being passionate about the field and helping me along the way and 
and, and kind of showing me what they do so that I could um, kind of follow their footsteps. And, and that's kind of a major part of my job as well. So I work with medical students. I work with medical students who want to get into neurosurgery. I work with residents um, across all through the seven years of residency uh, who work with me uh, on surgeries, who work with me outside the operating room, who work with me on research um, and um, helps them in defining their own pathway and writing their own story um, in neurosurgery. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, try to wrap up over here to kind of take some questions, have a little bit of a discussion, but um, I just wanted to share some thoughts and my perspectives about uh, cerebrovascular neurosurgery. And the bottom line is that uh, neurosurgery is really not a, a nine to five job. It's something that um, is, is really a lifestyle and, and has to be um, always take center stage uh, for a lot of people in their lives. Uh, I think it's really important to strike a balance, but uh, neurosurgery is one of those specialties or, or professions that really pushes you to the boundaries of really striking that balance, which often becomes hard. But um, it's a team sport. And as you can see, you have uh, uh, collaborators, you have researchers, you have nurses, you have technologists, you have students, you have residents that make it so much fun and make it a success. Um, it's a long training pathway. It's, uh, um, it's four years of college followed by the medical school and uh, followed by seven years of residency, followed by anywhere from one to three years of fellowship. Um, but um, uh, the long training pathway, um, it, it really flies by, especially if you're passionate about the field, especially if you love doing what you're doing. Um, and, um, and what's fascinating is that um, over the years, I've seen like people in, um, you know, their senior years of their high school, kind of knowing they wanted to do neurosurgery or being interested in neurosciences. And I think um, like every one of you who is part of the neuroscience society is so well positioned to be uh, in really the, the breeding ground for um, getting into neuroscience associated fields or really developing a, a passion for a career in neurosurgery. Um, and uh, uh, the bottom line is that cerebrovascular neurosurgery is one of the most high risk, high reward subspecialties in neurosurgery. These are the sickest patients and uh, um, the surgeries are very high risk, but uh, it's, it's a challenge and it's walking that fine line where um, you can help a lot of patients and uh, it's very rewarding. Uh, and um, the bottom line is that mentorship and passion and vision are the key themes that are important in, in uh, helping someone uh, um, uh, chart a career in neurosurgery. Um, there's a lot of role for translational research. Um, I have seen some major, major developments in neurosurgery and some beautiful stories on how people have um, really created new areas in neurosurgery new discoveries in neurosurgery from basic lab-based models. I mean, I gave you the example of a simple device for treatment of brain aneurysms. Uh, similarly, there have been models for brain stimulation for treating things such as depression, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, there have been discoveries related to uh, gene therapy um, for certain neurologic disorders. Um, there have been discoveries relating to better fluorescent tools and better imaging tools for brain tumors and visualizing them. Um, so the capacity for translational research uh, is uh, limitless in neurosurgery. Um, and, um, you know, I, I would uh, complete my talk by saying that neurosurgery is a very small community and, and that fascinates me every day. Um, when I was in medical school um, uh, and I wasn't even sure I was gonna be a neurosurgeon, um, and I worked at Mass General in that har lab in Harvard. Um, um, my mentor was a resident um, 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 in neurosurgery at Harvard, who is now one of the faculty at Harvard. Um, and we're good friends and it's, it's a very small world. Um, similarly, I shared with you the story of uh, Ron DiMatteo, who's one of the chair of, of neurosurgery, uh, chair of surgery at Penn who was one of my mentors as a medical student at Sloan Kettering. Uh, similarly, one of the residents at Penn, who's um, a neurosurgery resident, a chief resident this year, uh, was a medical student who worked with me when I was a resident at Stanford. 
So it just all comes together. Uh, if you're interested in uh, neurosurgery, neurosciences, um, uh, uh, you should jump on it sooner than later. Uh, make friends, partnerships, networks, um, and uh, this will all come together one day. Um, so um, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to all of you. And uh, I'm here for all of you if you are interested in learning more about neurosurgery, stopping by the operating room to see some of these surgeries, participating in research projects, being part of the lab, um, feel free to shoot me an email um, and i um, happy to take any questions at this time. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Chaudhry, for this very engaging presentation. Uh, certain, quite a number of questions were submitted, so now I will pick a couple of them. and. Uh, I will read them out. So the first one is related a bit to the career of a physician as a both as a physician and a scientist. So as a surgeon scientist, do you believe you would have benefited more from an MD PhD? Building on that, what is your surgery to research ratio? That's a really good question. And um, I think I'd start by saying that the pathway to neurosurgery uh, is, is in multiple ways. Uh, there's a lot of my colleagues and friends who did the MD-PhD pathway. There's some of my colleagues who uh, did an MPH or got an MBA and got into neurosurgery. And each of those chartered a very different uh, pathway. For me, my practice is approximately 70% uh, clinical and 30% research. Um, so um, I don't run my own experiments, but I have collaborators that I work with. I have students that work in my lab, um, and um, um, that's kind of how my research functions. Uh, but I'm still very actively involved in the research in that role. Um, um, for people or colleagues of mine who have done an MD-PhD, um, some of them have taken up a pathway where they have to commit to a 50-50 setup which that basically means that uh, two and a half days out of the week, literally, they have to be in the lab and they have to be writing grants. And the remaining two and a half days, they have to be um, operating maybe a day or a day and a half and then doing an outpatient clinic the other half. Um, it's hard to be everywhere at the same time. And uh, if you're MD, PhD, um, you have to commit yourself to very core basic sciences research in many cases. And it, it turns out to, that you can write a very nice story. Like um, I have had some of my colleagues who have done their basic sciences research on stem cells and um, uh, they've gotten a PhD and then they have gone on to become pediatric neurosurgeons and they are doing research on using stem cells for pediatric brain tumors. Um, similarly, some of them have done a PhD in doing um, computational neurosciences and they have gone on to do functional neurosurgery where their research is focused on memory and speech understanding in primate models. So, so it kind of fits in very nicely where you can tell that story. Uh, but if you are doing an MD PhD, then it, it has to be, especially if you're NIH funded, it ends up being uh, uh, like a 50% uh, or so commitment uh, to having your academic appointment. Yeah, thank you for this very comprehensive and very helpful answer to many people considering this MD PhD path, I, I assume, or having doubts about which one to choose. Uh, next question is, do you consider it a part of your job to delve into the recent literature regarding your area of expertise? And what is the typical protocol for when a surgeon wants to improve a certain surgery procedure? Um, that's another very good question uh, from Kevin. I think. Um, yeah, I think um, no matter what specialty you go into, um, you have to keep up uh, with the recent developments in the field by, uh, you know, keeping up with literature, by reading the research, by going to meetings. Um, the two big neurosurgery meetings um, are the American Association of Neurosurgeons AANS meeting and the Congress of Neurosurgeons meeting. Um, and then for cerebrovascular, there are specific meetings, which is called the CV section meeting and Society of Neurointerventional Surgery um, uh, that are good meetings. And all those meetings, if you're in that field, you kind of keep up with the developments in that area. And, um, uh, and, and how you improve a certain surgical procedure, 
Uh, that's the beauty of neurosurgery. It's like a wide open field and you can come up with ideas and tools in which you think you can make a procedure more efficient. Um, and I often feel like you come up with solutions when you run into problems. Um, and um, a perfect example is that if you run into a situation where you're like, I feel like this aneurysm is very hard to treat. There has to be a better way of doing it. And uh, then you can essentially start working on a solution for it by looking at funding, by looking at research on a uh, in vitro model or an animal model and working with engineers to come up with solutions that could uh, help you do that. And uh, because it's such a subspecialized area in neurosurgery, um, whatever you do is going to be very novel. And um, the other question was, how do you practice performing a surgery that no one has ever done before? Um, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot of different models for doing that. Now we employ a lot of 3D printing. And um, I'd love for you guys to see some of the things that are being done for 3D printing in cerebral vascular, where we can print out the 3D models of brain aneurysms. And we can actually put that into a beating heart model um, and use that to treat the aneurysms from the inside and place stents and place coils and practice doing that. So that's one way of simulating it. And uh, for a lot of the bypass surgery and different ways of doing bypass surgery, we can practice on mice models. We can practice on um, various kinds of animal models. And sometimes on turkey wings and chicken wings under the microscope, we can use that to hone our microsurgical skills. But uh, uh, again, it's not perfect, but uh, there's a lot of substitutions before you actually get on the operating table that allows you to become comfortable, become facile, and to test out your surgical procedure before you actually get there. And you know, for people interested in surgery, the most fascinating stories are from Michael DeBakey, who was uh, one of the most famous uh, cardiac surgeons um, at Texas Heart Institute in, in, in Texas, who um, really came up with a lot of these uh, vascular procedures and would test them out on animals. And you know, back in the day, some of these surgeries did not go very well. Um, and now there's a lot, a lot more checks and balances and we have simulation models for doing that, but that kind of gives you an idea in terms of some of these things are like an uphill task and, and you always have to push boundaries and do the impossible. And often you end up doing things that, you know, you may lose patience in the way because you're doing something very novel, but there's a, a method to do it and making it safe by doing simulations, by studying it, by doing animal models. Yeah, thank you for that. So probably the natural question that follows is that it's about reviewing anatomy and how do you, you know, uh, despite this very small distances that brain provides, how do you manage with, uh, you know, do you review uh, on an operation basis uh, the anatomy or how is the process, how is the prep process in that sense? That's, that's a very good question. And I think that I would answer that by saying that the imaging has come a long way. You can get some beautiful pictures of brain blood vessel, of brain structure. Um, and for you know students who are interested in brain imaging, if you look at MRI imaging, like seven Tesla MRIs, um, as well as uh, angiography, MR angiography, CT angiography, you can have a, a, a very good or an accurate picture of what you're gonna encounter in surgery, even before you make an incision. So really understanding that imaging before you go into surgery is what makes the surgery safe. Um, and similarly, you know, studying cadaveric anatomy when you were in residency in medical school um, are the bases that help you get there. But the imaging is what gives you the, the exact picture of what you're going to see there. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so I guess the last question uh, would be uh, in your endovascular neurosurgery fellowship were you able to practice performing these kinds of surgeries such as brain aneurysms uh, yes so um, these um, um, training these fellowships are are uh, are aimed at making you capable and adequately trained for treating aneurysms so when I was doing my endovascular fellowship I got training and doing procedures from inside the blood vessel and uh, you know, putting coils or stents and devices.
assistant. And um, at the same time, because I was in residency, I was treating with patients and residents with open surgery too. So it gave me a perspective of doing both um, during my neurosurgical training. So maybe as a closing question, would you have any advice to students interested in pursuing whether medicine or the pathway you chose or neurosurgery in general? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, uh, you know, keep an open mind and, uh, uh, you know, neurosciences is fascinating. Uh, even if you don't choose neurosurgery, I just feel like there are so many areas in neurosciences that require passionate people who love science, who uh, want to make a difference. And, um, and I think it's just, you know, keep that passion alive. And um, that's probably the big thing that keeps me going in my job and long hours. Um, but, you know, taking care of um, conditions that I'm passionate about, um, you know, being on the constant run for learning and sharing experiences with your trainees and mentees is, uh, is what, what keeps you going. So, so that would be my takeaway advice is that neurosciences is wonderful and neurosurgery is great. I'm biased, of course, but uh, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, there's a lot of room for uh, people who are passionate about the field uh, to be a part of it. And I'm excited to cross paths with um, many of you uh, as you guys take your careers forward. Thank you very much for answering this question and for this great, inspiring presentation. Uh, I'm sure everyone really enjoyed your uh, cases you presented in such a detail and you presented the te technologies, you know, standing behind it. Uh, and thank you for standing, for staying a bit, you know, later than we agreed on initially. We really appreciate it and we uh, hope that you also enjoy it. And, you know, thank you very much for uh, and your science society. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And um, um, I would just say uh, to all of you that feel free to reach out whatever I can do for any of you uh, moving forward, it would be my pleasure. Um, my email um, uh, is something I can write down in the chat right here. And um, um, I would uh, love to uh, hear from you and to um, work with um, uh, many of you in the future. So. Um, have a good evening, everyone, and uh, uh, it's been uh, great uh, seeing you all. Thank you very much.